So yeah, uh, welcome to um, the uh, book club for JavaScript for R, uh, as run by the R for Data Science Slack community. Um, uh, we are yeah, uh, we're working through chapter six of this book, which um, is one where it, that introduces a um, a kind of substantial JavaScript library that's wrapped by HTML widgets, which means that as an R developer, if you um, can incorporate that library in your um, in your package, you will then be able to use it when you make things like HTML outputs from R Markdown, um, use it within Shiny and things. Um, the um, library uh, Ryan's going to take us through in a minute uh, is called Piety, which um is a way of writing kind of inline um bar charts and and, and things like that in in the text of a, a kind of html document anyway um uh yeah the this video will be posted on youtube um i trust you're all happy with that by now because you've been coming back um we've got a few more chapters left in this i think it's the second section of the book because um, the first was quite quite an introductory kind of background and prerequisites type section. Um, uh, yeah, so next week um, there will be a, another, there's another library, I think it's G, GIO, uh, that, that we are going to look at incorporating in R as well, um, which is like a kind of, global um, data visualization type library, um, which looks extremely neat and certainly isn't the kind of thing that you would want to write from scratch in R. Um, anyway, I'll leave it over to Ryan. Uh, if anyone uh, wants to join us to um, discuss the book club contents and things like that, if they're watching on YouTube and things, you're more than welcome to join us on the Slack channel um and there will be a link to it on the youtube page um yeah i'll leave it to ryan now though okay good thank you russ uh gonna share our screen let's do desktop two and we are sharing all right now one of the things i want to convey uh following on with with russ's comment is uh, I'm not complete here, and I'm hoping that through it's 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 the last section of this chapter, the HTML section, that uh, I started getting errors, and I, I it's probably something very minor and small that I'm not uh, finding, but I'm hoping that uh, the team I don't want to troubleshoot during a presentation. That's usually not a good time to do that either, but uh, at any rate, um, team is the is the screen okay? Uh, font size good, okay. So this is chapter six, a realistic widget. Um, I wrote down uh, four learning objectives um, as I'm displaying this. We're not going to be on static presentation the whole time. I'm actually jumping over to R and we'll, we'll talk about what we're doing here. Um, I'll just run through these first initial steps. Uh, the first one I wrote down is the ability to utilize the use this create package and also the HTML widgets scaffold widget libraries. In both uh, Arthur's uh, Shaw's presentation last week and this week, uh, those are the first two things we need to do. We create our package and we add an HTML scaffolding to it, our HTML tools. Those elements are now providing our framework that we can start building or adding additional dependencies and libraries and ex access points, et cetera. The second bullet we have is to demonstrate the ability to modify your ints W, uh, HTML widgets, and then whatever package name you call it, YAML file. Now I'll talk about this here in a second because I'm changing, modifying my name of the package, which is going to create this uh, particular point where I have to separate from what the instructions in the book are calling on versus what I'm doing currently. It may be why I'm having issues in the later part of the book. We'll see that in a second. The third bullet is to modify both R and JavaScript files 
rules, allowing for mutual exchange of data. As we go through the section of implementation for this chapter, we're going to notice that the author is having us go in and modify some of these files. But what you're doing is matching the R uh, instruction and then the JavaScript, we'll call it the uh, catch point or the link between R and JavaScript. We're making sure that these are both the same. If we change in one, we have to change in another. And then the last bullet is to create the widget name uh, HTML function for inline use of the package. I haven't done that yet. That's actually where my error is. So uh, let me get to that point and we'll try to work as a team to resolve that. Um, we're going to use the uh, piety. Piety uh, plugin authored by Ben Pickle. Um, Russ, uh, I, I kept calling it um, like like Catholic pi pious type thing, and that's not accurate. It's actually like deity only with the p p piety. Um, it, what it does is it allows for an SVG, small SVG image that can be nested in line with your text of an HTML web page. So you could put in a graph inside your, your line of text. I thought that was kind of neat. Now we'll do this through both a span tag and a div tag. And so we'll see the differences between the two from our, from our web-based output side. Um, next is going to be uh, the steps to begin. So the first thing we need to do is run that create package. And I've already accomplished that in this example, I'm calling it my uh, PID example. And then you also run the HTML widgets, scaffolding widget, uh, scaffold widget, and then again, the same name. Um, what I commented here is note, I'm switching to a new example that won't be included in our repo. It is intended that you can do this on your own. What I was implying is the slide deck that I'm showing you here versus the second R instance where the actual uh, local named, uh, Ryan named uh, package is being developed. So we've got two instances of R running here. All right, let me show you that I've done that example. So what ends up occurring when you run that packaging service, it was piety, where'd that go? My piety example, there we go. When you run that first initial uh, use this and then build your, your scaffolding component, not scaffolding, build your, your architecture here, your package architecture. You're gonna uh, be listed with all of these various directories and, and some very boilerplate uh, form, vanilla form of, of data entry, right? So once that's complete, the first thing that happens here is that you'll create this um, named package.r file, that's gonna be instructions. And then you have your, your YAML file that also opens as well. A third is the JavaScript instruction. So those three will automatically pop open. And then uh, maybe not, Arthur, jump in if, if I'm misconveying this. When you run your HTML scaffolding is when it generates your uh, example.js, correct? Or the JS file. Either way, there's, there's an instruction here that will generate these various folders, directories, and files contained in, in R. The two that we're most going to be interacting with the most are going to be the named.r file and the named.js file. And I'm using name as being this populated variable of whatever you want to call it. Okay. Um, next is back to instructions. The next point that our author is telling us to follow is we need to update our dependencies in both your package and also so that the JavaScript library knows where those files exist or where the, where the re rename that, the doc, document object model knows where to find the local files stored on your computer that you're calling on to allow the Java, uh, JavaScript runtime environment to operate. So we're going to create this script. I'm citing back to the authors, uh, chapter six, to create this. I've never done this before, so this was kind of neat to run. Um, normally I'll create these outside of R, but we're calling on this directory.create, and then we're providing a path of where that directory will be generated. Uh, other users uh, may do some other commands to uh, express this as well. Uh, Windows, you can 
you can do a, a dir command, I think, is that uh, create a dir uh, on window or on, on Unix, it's like make dir. Um, you, you, you're just generating these files of where they're located or these, these directories where they're located. Uh, both of them are going to be under the inst HTML widgets path. And then we're creating this jQuery and this uh, piety. Within that, we are providing a pointer of outside space, global space, that we're pulling in these files to store local to your machine. So I'm, we're providing a instruction to say, go to GitHub, uh, user's name, then pickles, and download the piety master jQuery piety minimum JS file, put it into this directory. The same thing happens with jQuery. We're going out to this code.js and grabbing the min version, minified version, uh, 351 of the jQuery library, and then putting it into the jQuery directory. Give me a second, I'll show you what I did. So again, I'm highlighting our folder, our directory structure over here. If I went into the inst and then HTML widgets, there's my jQuery and there's my piety. Inside is the two files that we added in here. Okay. Um, if you were to view these, they're not fun to look at here. Uh, they are minified. Uh, if you want, you can go to the raw, sorry, the, the original URL. They do have an unminified version. Uh, the other option is you. there's tools out on the web that you can unminify files and it just adds your white space back into um, the, uh, the JavaScript file. It puts it back into a, a much more human readable form. All right, let's go back to presentation. Do we have any questions yet, team, from anybody? All right. So the, the download, the two download points, uh, again, are, are putting those uh, into those directories. The script will download these two JavaScript files to your local machine. An alternative is you can call on a uh, content delivery network, CDN. The author is making a comment that um, if you want your system to be more robust, then you can download your library directly to your machine, and then you're just accessing uh, your local space uh, for those instead of uh, calling to the outside world. If you don't have an internet connection, this would be an option that you could run. Okay. Step number four is we also need to add these dependencies to your YAML file. And the uh, path that was created was uh, mypiety example, inst HTML widgets, mypiety example.yaml. What we're doing is changing or providing the dependencies, the requirements of versions to these JavaScript or jQuery libraries for this service to work. My question to the group, and it was not directly answered, and this is maybe me being a bit naive on the JavaScript world, how do I know what versions to go after? How do I know what versions to, to call on? Russ, during our, our initial uh, connection, we were talking about Node.js or uh, some of these other JavaScript libraries that will automatically prompt you and say, hey, you've got a dependency conflict going on here. Okay, that's great. That's fine. That makes sense. But as a, as a developer, as an engineer or somebody, software engineer that's writing this, uh, front-end developer, how do I know what libraries to call on? What, how can I confirm what versions to call on? Yeah, it's, it's funny because actually, I mean, you can look on things like I mean, I'm looking on npmjs.com and, and looking at the yeah. dependencies for, for, for this package. Yeah. And it does say that there's zero dependencies, but I, I presume that jQuery is so common that it, it doesn't need to be stated or something. But I mean, maybe it's just that the way that the, the, there's an alternative way of interacting with it that mm -hmm. wouldn't require jQuery. Um, Let me see if, if you don't mind, I'm going to open that. Uh, particular path open. I, can you hear me? Um, yeah, go ahead, sir. Okay. Uh, no, I was just going to jump in actually. So I, I think the, syn the syntax that we're using in this particular example utilizes jQuery. I don't know that one needs jQuery in particular. Right. Um, sorry, I, I think I only halfway know this because my, my, my wife was uh, trying to load jQuery into a web page recently for one of her projects and this uh, uh, 
it, it, it kind of looks like it, like the dollar sign, I guess, is a valid, uh, sorry, I guess, um, if you look, um, I guess on the book on 6.2 implementation, it looks like there's a, a bit of syntax there. And, and to my eyes, it looks like it's, yeah, or, or that I think is, is actually jQuery. So I think much as dollar sign is a valid JavaScript variable, I, I think what's going on here is we're invoking some method, but I guess it's a PAD specific method, but I guess maybe through jQuery. Anyway, that that's a kind of a, a halfway educated guess, which could be completely wrong. So well, we're saying no. that it's a guess. <laughs> agreed, agreed. No, the dollar sign is definitely a, a jQuery form of, of call. My, my question that I was posing uh, for debate or discussion was, how do we know that we need version 3.5.1? Now again, this is the example in the in the book, right? That's fine, but let's say four years from now, that may not be a valid call anymore. The library may be there, but hey, it might have dependency issues or whatever the whatever's going on, right? There's going to be somewhere in the future something will break. My question yeah. is, and, uh, and, the, and even I mean, th this may not be the only widget that you present on your web page and if you're embedding this in shiny or something you'll already be loading jquery and if you've updated shiny jquery will be updated along with that um so how do you maintain how do you ensure that the um the dependencies for um this library aren't kind of um overwritten by the dependencies you know, by a dependency on the same library, but maybe a different version or, or something like that. Um, and I, it, it may be a naive question, um, but uh, uh, Arthur, thank you for posting earlier this week uh, or, or late last week, uh, following us, uh, last week's discussion uh, about the storage space, et cetera. Uh, maybe this is a question that I can, I can go research as well. Um, different methodology or different ways in which we can confirm that various versions match each other and that dependency tree that is required. Um, all too often, it's a really, really hot topic in, in the world of JavaScript that uh, things change so fast. Vulnerabilities get corrected so quickly uh, and uploaded and then pushed out to the, to the world in general. Um, as a developer, it's very often that you will be in a conflict. You'll have, you know, an issue going on with this version of whatever environment, dev environment you're working in, and you may have to upgrade. Well, if you upgrade that, it's probably going to break something else. So this configuration stack, this concept of matching everything together is important. I'll try to find a, a good answer for us and uh, see if I can post that. It's a question that I have for myself, uh, hence why I'm, I'm asking about it. All right. Uh, step number five, we want to validate the local copies of your, excuse me, before I go there, just to show you that I did create that change. So again, this is a direct copy and paste from the text into uh, this, uh, this package, but uh, we're calling on the jQuery 351 and the uh, PyD uh, JavaScript uh, for 330. If you would like, I can pull over. Let's see if I can do this quickly. Move that to this side. Just pull that open briefly. What uh, what I wanted to show, and I don't know, I do know the answer to this one. Uh, you will often find there will be a package.json, especially in a in a node environment type concept, npm, uh, node package manager. You'll always have this package.json. I'm not sure if other libraries do the same thing. Uh, but in this case, uh, the author of this package, or author of this uh, uh, JavaScript, um, Mr. Ben Pickles, uh, makes a comment about the 3.0.330. Where did that go? There was one of these push notifications where it says updating to version 3.3.0. Great NPM packages, maybe. Is that where I saw that at? Anyway, he bumped the rev to 330 based on that uh, change. So, all right. Start going back again. The next topic is step number five. 
I'm not pulling in the right. Uh, validate the local copies of your dependency using this DevTools load all. Now, what the what the instructions was telling, what the instruction was telling us, by using DevTools load all, you are going to pull in all of the dependencies, pull in, match all of the requirements of your package, uh, including possibly running all of the, uh, is it generate the vignettes, generate all your documentation, etc. Load all does a lot of of activity in the background. By loading all, what we're actually trying to achieve or what we're trying to validate is we want to know that the data that we put in our YAML file, YAML file the earlier script that we wrote to uh, download and or paste these JavaScript instructions into these uh, uh, directory locations that we commanded, uh, we're just validating that it's there. Why this is important was because I, na I named my content slightly different, so I had to go um, correct this. What you're doing is calling on system file, um, and then you're looking for HTML widgets piety and that the package name is my piety example. If these aren't correct, you will get nothing down here at the bottom. It'll come back. It won't be null. You just won't have any data. It'll just be two quotation marks. Um, when I changed the package name to being my piety example, then I was able to populate this line of text, just as fair warning to the to the group. Okay. Since I changed the name of the package to my PyD example, also uh, following the instructions in step three, I had to modify my system file call uh, to confirm. The other option was they wanted you to run a test and we look at the dev tools version of the browser to confirm that the libraries are populated properly. So let me do that real quick for us. And down here at the bottom, uh, it's not going to work. I'm still troubleshooting this error. It was only after I did this call that it created the problem. Let's see if I can do it that way. Uh, Now let's try to run a test. I'm going to have problems. Uh, so team, this is what I was trying to troubleshoot right before the call. And I'm sorry that I don't want us to try to figure out how to resolve things um, while also in the Zoom meeting and, and, and making this call or presenting all of this. But the, um, go um, ahead. You your options okay um in, in your the list that you're assigning to x there your options is is kind of forwarding the um the 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 triple dot operator so do we you don't have that in your function and okay so, um so it probably would be um i don't know are the options the the width and height and things like that wouldn't be part of the options would they uh, no, they're past in uh, level. So maybe, yeah, that's um, yeah. Maybe you just need to add in the triple dot parameter in your function definition uh, up here. Yeah, yeah. Like after type in that function definition line. Let me. Maybe that's what I'm missing then. When I was excuse me page that I'm after is not here. So where I got or where I was getting caught on. Okay. So I, I, I started this implementation piece. My first initial problem that I ran into was, I don't know where this lives. I don't recognize this. I don't know what file we're calling on to change. And this is, this is on me. This is not the author that's making this, this uh, uh, difficult. I'm just not figuring out what we're doing here. So I realized where that was. Uh, we were talking about the, the element ID. This is gonna be in your, in your uh, HTML file that you're seeing this, uh, the element ID. Uh, we're calling on these different um, numeric values, the, the list here. But the 
common is saying is to make your script a little bit more eloquent, to make it a little more robust, to make it a little easier, uh, instead of being just static calls, you can make it in a more dynamic fashion that things are starting to populate and the system's just a little bit smarter. So instead of having a unique element ID, uh, we're calling on uh, uh, the namespace JavaScript element ID uh, to populate here instead. Um, it's this point. No, not yet, not yet, not yet. Keep scrolling here. We changed the element uh, to inner text and then combining it with data. Uh, again, inner text equals data. The statement says you need to go modify this to be more jQuery oriented, Arthur, to your uh, benefit. So we changed, instead of a pound sign, it went to this element piety bar and then fill red, green, blue. This isn't where I'm at though, team, I'm sorry. That'll be it. Uh, this one right here, yeah. this one right here. So Russ, the type and then match argument type should be the same as what I had because that hasn't modified. Yeah, that no, that's correct, yeah. Match um, argument it's type. The, it's the, the subsequent parameter in the author's function definition is the thing that you're missing. Um, if you go back to- um, Up here? The, if you go back to your notes. Yep. This is the- um, It's a function of data type, the triple dots, width, height, and element ID. And it's that triple dots- in It's the right here. That you don't have in your function definition. Outstanding catch. Thank you that I did not see that. So I don't know if anyone is unaware, but those- triple dots are the way that you kind of pass um, uh, a way for the user of a function to pass arguments through that um, the author hasn't necessarily given a named parameter for. So if you're, you know, calling a lower level function, you can pass arguments onwards. Um, that did it. Thank you, Russ. That was, that, that was driving me nuts. Um, what I debugged a lot of our... <laughs> <laughs> what uh, what I found after this <clears throat> in the previous examples when I ran test it would create test on my on my uh, entry here. Now that I've modified this, all I'm getting is this red bar. But I don't know if that's because the chart is coming through. But I'm not I'm not populating it with data yet, so it's not uh, rendering anything. Uh, it's just giving me this flat line red bar. Uh, but the important point that I was hoping to check here, going back to our instructions, is to expand your head point of your HTML file. And what you're wanting to see is that you're calling on these two uh, JavaScript libraries, or jQuery uh, 351 and then the, the piety 330. You want to make sure that those are there and that you're not getting any uh, errors saying that it can't access those files. Your YAML file, your pointer is correct. So now once that's established, what we were mentioning that Russ just guided us with uh, is your relationship between the R instruction and the JavaScript itself. Let me go back and I'll show you what I'm referring to. So this function we're, we're manipulating is inside the R file. Okay, so it's your R Studio side. And the whole book, the whole relationship here is R Studio passing to JavaScript so that we can manipulate our document object model from a web standpoint. So the R environment versus the JavaScript environment are important. If you manipulate it in one side, you're going to have to manipulate it on the other side as well. And Arthur, I appreciated last week when you made that a very clear uh, point. I think it had to do with the um, I think it was the color. I think we were changing the color of the, the not the theme, but just the element ID itself. We were uh, making a inline uh, change. So uh, I'm, I'm gonna purposely close my YAML file because I don't want that open. And I was just looking at that earlier too. So if we change in the R side, 
and Russ had us add the dot, dot, dot here, we're adding this as an option for list below. The corresponding instructions in the textbook were having us change this element ID from a inner uh, it's a, sorry element inner text is still X data, but this updated on line twenty is now the uh, jQuery call to element the library itself and then X type. My curiosity to the group because I'm renaming my package to my PyD example, am I making a error not calling on the right function? Uh, the, 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 the function doesn't exist in the namespace. The, the, although it's pointing at the right JavaScript library, I would expect it to know that that's where it's at. I'm curious why it's just giving me a red line instead. I, yeah, no, I don't think that's what underpins your red line, to be honest. Okay. Because if you look at the very start of the chapter, there's an example mm -hmm. that's written in purely in HTML that Correct. has, um, uh, there's a selector that selects a, an, an ID called bar and then calls the payity um, method on it in, in the script below that. Yep. So that method is something that is um, presumably provided by the jQuery.payity.min.js. This particular file, you're, I, I think you're correct. This, I did not incorporate this file or this example into our, into our uh, presentation at the moment. Hmm. Um, I can quickly do that. Because again, I, I, I think you're, you're, you are accurate. Yeah, um, yeah. Throughout, the, throughout the remaining sections of this chapter, it's these two lines that we're conversing over. Yeah. Um, to be honest, it, it, for, for learning, it, it's a bit better that you haven't named your package the same as the name of the library that we're using because the library is using methods with the same name as well. And it's right. quite hard to tease out um yes whether you know where the where each function lies when you're uh, reading through the book uh, to, to the to the benefit of of me being a little selfish uh i did that for the purposes of of trying to not completely copy and paste everything from the book yeah. um we're, we're we were discussing that uh topic earlier and uh so i i've, I've been trying my hardest my best not to directly make it identical um i'm i'm, I'm, I'm not uh, i don't want to plagiarize i guess is my point <laughs> so the um in that comment though if if we're looking at those two lines of of text from the html example above um is that maybe be why we're only getting a red line because i don't have any of that instruction for the document document object model to render so it's just kind of flatlining on me what it is producing that? something, yes, but what I think it's that it's actually happening in your example is that you just aren't passing any numbers through to it at okay. the moment. Are you okay. you're passing in? Um, I don't know exactly what the message was that you were calling in, but if you copy the um, at the bottom of your screen at the moment, that there, if you the the payity C one five six two is a call within R. Okay. Um, so if you rename the function that's called from payity to my payity my. example, yep, and and pass in those same, um, I won't do that. Oh no, um, there we go. In, in yeah, in your console, mm -hmm. it might be a slight problem because the colors seem to seems to be three colors and four values, but we can fix that in a minute. Okay. Yep. Yeah. I did it. So the yeah. So the thing is that you you were calling it with test as a string, and it was just kind of it, there would have been some exception inside, and it was mm -hmm. just the the axis or something like that. So in essence, Russ, what we're doing is, uh, and I, I know this image is so everly small. Um, I don't know if I can increase that. Yeah, that increases the whole size of the window. Um, but 
for item number one, we're using the number one as our first entry, and that's going to be a red bar. Mm. Okay. And then we're using five. So we're increasing our, our height, right, as measured of the green bar. And then the next value six is going to be blue, which is slightly higher than five. And then it repeat, or sorry, it goes back to red at the beginning. So if I were to change, just I'm going to do this hypothetically. Let's do uh, nine, uh, three, eight, one, and then run that again. The size gets smaller. I understand that, and we can we can work on the the uh, rendering because that's this resize function at the bottom, the width and height. But um, what I want to recognize is it's red, green, blue, red, green, blue, red, green. I don't have another number, so it doesn't show blue, but it's just repeating itself. That red, green, blue is just repeating itself, RGB. Yeah. All right. Um, now, going back to our the instructions are really over. I don't have much more um, after that chapter, or sorry, step five. Um, the, the step six is where I was caught on it, it, it wasn't running for me. And then after that, I haven't written anything because at this point I was just mainly focusing on R um, as the presentation media. So following the instructions in the book, uh, towards the bottom half of this implementation sequence, the author is indicating, sorry for jumping back and forth here. What we're doing is changing the jQuery itself or the relationship between what R is doing versus what JavaScript is doing as it manipulates the document model. And the, the, the relationship that the author is conveying is saying that it's a placeholder and you need to, to be a little better at managing that placeholder because you may be in a dynamic environment. Um, not all users are gonna be the same. So um, how do you, take it from a static value and make it a little bit more in a dynamic value. And so that element ID and then the PyD bar uh, changes to just element PyD. And I think the last one is it changes to, instead of data, it's X type. Um, so this is giving us the option from our list feature of bar line pi or donut. Which one do you want to call on? Well, now I can I can make it a little bit more dynamic, um, and I didn't get to the very end where we're uh, uh, listing it out here. But if if the team is okay, if, and if you give me just a brief moment, I'm going to try and run this real fast and see if I can get that to populate. And it should because I have this last. I did not. Let me add that back in there. I need to add that to the JavaScript library. I, I think it's quite that. nice because he he kind of gradually generalizes the original code. So at the moment, it's hard coded to have those red, green, blue, red, green, blue colors. That's and correct. By um, then, um, and is hard coded to be a bar chart, I think. Oh no, may, maybe not in your code at the moment. Um, but and then he allowed the user a way to pass in the type of bar that you want to the, the type of chart that you want to create and then the the next step of generalization is passing in any other kind of um visualization tw mm -hmm. tweaking options um so that might be the colors it might be whether they're um checked or whatever um yeah, it's quite. It's a neat little example of kind of, kind of refactoring and generalizing the code as you as you go. It's, it's quite nice. Like print element inner text. I'm not putting in the right area. That's what's going on. I didn't put it in the right spot. Be down here. That goes there. 
uh, X type and then X dot options, right? And it had it as closed parentheses. I think you just need a comma before it and, and to remove the hard coded okay. object. The fill value, correct? Uh, uh, yeah. Um, you're shaking his head, yes. So it's yeah, this so all the way up to here. That, that X dot options is is to replace the the thing in the curly braces that contains the okay pole. so then i should be able to do that yeah uh, does that match yes that matches okay give this a shot dev tools good Okay, so now we're getting all blue, which is fine. That's because I haven't specified an option. Just the number of elements are, are coming across. That's good. Let's do this again. We'll just delete quantity. Okay, so I've got three elements, one, five, and six. It happens to be one, five, and then six. Nothing's changed there, just the numbers coming through. So now from the textbook, and I hope we're doing okay on time. It's doing that. And this browsable is the first time that we're calling on this, correct? Mm. But this should generate the output run if five. Sorry. PyD run if five. Type is line quarter pi with these two values and then donut. Let's try this real quick. Let's see. Back to our session here. Yeah, I'm not doing that right. Type line, unused argument type is line. Move this over. Keep with our session here. I just need to get that window focused so I can stop changing back and forth here. So in the example we're trying, we're calling on the HTML tools. We're calling browsable function, tag list function, and then passing uh, the piety run if numeric value five, piety run if five, type is line, piety this, 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 this. And it's just one big long list. The error I'm getting is this first run if type five. And now is that calling it because it don't doesn't know what to do with line yet? But I had line in the R example. One of the things that is particularly relevant here is that your your function name is called something different. Oh, that's a good point. So that would express it would why would work if you used uh, my piety example yep. as the function name. Then I think okay. Well, that's on me to make such a change. I should have had it shortened. And I'm, I'm welcome to critique while I'm doing this. You are all more than happy to. Hopefully you're also open to praise, Ryan, because I think uh, <laughs> as, as, as Russ said, this is the, just tweaking some bits is uh, probably the best way to learn because yeah. then you see how everything's connected. Yes. All right, so now that that's changed, good point. That's a good point. I, I did the same in, in prep for for last week and uh, <laughs> I guess also ran into some, some issues which uh, came came strictly prior to the presentation. Uh, good point. So it looks like it looks like our values came through. Uh, the, the past, um, points that we had uh, is, is listed. So now the, the, the last instruction that we have is literally section 6.3, the HTML element. Now the, the comment here that is important that we want to give complete and utter focus to is the statement about the underscore HTML. So the HTML tools uh, package within R automatically looks for any named variable underscore HTML. It, it, it automatically searches for that. And the, the statement from the author is 
uh, commenting that if we call piety HTML function dot dot dot, and then we use the HTML tags uh, with span dot dot dot, uh, this will come in. I'm sorry, let me show you on the screen so that I'm not just talking without actually expressly showing you what I'm talking. So this can also be handy if some arguments must be hard coded, such as assigning in a specific class to every widget. So we have my widget underscore HTML. And here, the first example was piety HTML. The important is this underscore HTML. Um, let's see, it's this thing here. This is probably the first such, such function one encounters and is rel relatively uncommon, but it is literally how the HTML widgets package does it. It scans the namespace of the package looking for a function that starts with the name of the widget and ends in HTML. So it doesn't matter what you name it. I guess in the example we're providing, it doesn't matter what a user creates another function. If it underscores this HTML, it's gonna get pulled into the, into the uh, document object model. Um, and it's found, uh, found Use it. Uh, otherwise, it's used. Uh, it uses the default div tag. Uh, the function takes the three dot construct dot 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 and uses them in the HTML tag. So does so. that does that mean for for the widget that you've created, mm -hmm. you you when when you call my piety example with yep. your arguments. Yeah. This uh, whatever would be my piety example underscore HTML. No, I think it we could be call it by HTML widgets kind of magically or something. No, I, I, I think the reference that we're making in the package, my example piety or my piety example, that's just the package that we created, right? So somebody were to download it from, you know, whatever dev tools, GitHub, mm -hmm. you know, install or, or, or local space, or if we, if we, pull it from CRAN, let's just say that it were published to CRAN. Yeah. When that user downloads, we already have it installed as the name. And it's going to call on HTML tools as a as a as a reference or a package dependency to the to, to our package. What I'm saying is if we name something Russ underscore HTML, right, within the loaded namespace of your R session using this particular package that we just created, the my Paid example, right? If I call on Russ underscore HTML, that's what we're actually creating. So we can call Russ underscore HTML function dot 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 HTML tool span whatever. Does that help? Does it make sense? Yeah. Or am I interpreting it correctly? That's how I read this particular just, sentence. So I haven't got to that section. <laughs> but, uh, right. Okay. When, when, whenever I see the dot, 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 to me, it means that the package is already loaded in namespace. We already have to call on it because if you, if you, if you were to just use, you know, Russ underscore HTML calling on function dot, 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 it's going to say, I have no idea what you're talking about. I, I don't, I, I don't know what to use this dot, dot, dot with. But that could be how I'm interpreting it too. I could be mistaken. Um, this can also come in handy if some arguments must be hard coded, such as assigning a specific class to every widget, um, reloading the package after placing the function above anywhere in the package will produce the line charts as shown. So that's what I wanted to do is just grab this. And now that we've got those changes, let's see if it'll work. It did not. But again, you, uh, you because we're using the wrong. Yep. Thank you, sir. Just. Great, great, great statement. No. It's going to go throughout everywhere. Yeah, it'll be in all of these points. Painful for anybody that's watching this, <laughs> watching somebody else type. Uh, uh, it's not my paid package, it's my paid example. 
so what what we should be seeing here is that the so they were originally in a div and now they should be in a span span, span. so but div is gonna oh sorry doesn't quite look like in the book does it so mm -hmm. it doesn't look like maybe is is it that you do you have to add the underscore html suffixed function into your package good oh man so that that was what kind of what i understood russ but i also had a kind of a question ar around this and, and looking at this section uh, mm -hmm. and you know russ and ryan is um which which well actually several questions so <laughs> I mean, so, so first, let me start with what I think I understand. What I think I understand is, you know, we have this little basically wrapper function, you know, with a, a, the a, PID underscore HTML for the first example. Mm -hmm. And it's just passing the dots to HTML tools, which is creating a, a span for us instead of a div. I guess the div being the default, right? Um, so then I, I, I'm wondering, like, for, for this function, clearly it should be in our R script because we have to define it somewhere. Right. But I'm wondering, is it a standalone function or is it something that happens within our, our like, PID function? Or in your case, Ryan, like, PID, um, my PID example. example. Because I guess where I'm getting a little confused and finally coming now to my question is, you know, in, in, in the book, it, it's showing us running, you know, we're executing the PID function, right? Mm -hmm. But the PID function should contain, I mean, it, it, it should be giving us a div still, right? Um, unless somehow we've, we've, we've altered, altered, the, altered the, the name of it, or, or sorry, altered the content of it such that it gives us a span. So I don't know, should we be, should we should we be executing this underscore HTML uh, uh, function, or should that be like nested within the function definition for the the PID uh, function? Not, not sure by, if that's making any sense. It does. No, no. I think at the moment we didn't call on the jQuery. Uh, well, it's not jQuery. It's it's just the the span call. We didn't we didn't we didn't create the span call. So by default, it is going to put it in a div. And so popping this out. As Russ had mentioned, that's why we're having this line break here. So we can now, and then new line, chart, use PID, chart, in line with text, chart. Well, that's our example that we have, but it's not in span. It's not technically in line yet. Um, now we are generating, okay, this element ID, HTML widget, some arbitrary number, okay, style width, height, uh, uh, the my PID example, HTML widget, HTML widget static bound, uh, and then ending dot, dot, dot. Then the next point comes in with our SVG element, the standard vectors graphic element. So it's not technically span. Um, span would be all in one line. Div is managing it slightly different. The document object model is managing it slightly different. Um, Go back to here. Okay. I'm sorry. I wanted to show this example with my. So if you went back to your package and added in a HTML function, mm -hmm. would would we be able to see the the change um, on w when it gets rendered? Then we should be able to. Uh, we'd have to again, incorporated into the updated package element um, by just making the change and saving it. I, I'm pretty sure it doesn't automatically make it available to call on. Um, so it's this point, this span dot, dot, dot that I'm missing. I don't have that anywhere. Um, but is that just a direct call on it, or uh, I'm, I'm creating a variable, a named variable, and populating with function dot, 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 which is, again, to author's statement, calling on HTML tools, tags, and then span. I haven't done that yet. 
This can also come in handy if your arguments must be hard-coded. Reloading the package after placing the function above anywhere in the package will produce an inline chart as shown. I, I, this is, as, as I was going through this later part of the chapter, I couldn't comprehend what file we were referring to to put some of the code in. So let's just take this for example. This is our code, right? It, it would be in the R file, but my curiosity would be where in the R file? Because if we're, if we're creating another, if we're creating another function named function P, uh, uh, Py HTML, PID HTML in the R function, it would be under this point here, correct? I, sorry, I don't think it. I don't think it would be. I think it would be a standalone function in the the, the kind of packages namespace. Um, I, I, whether I wonder if there's the source code for the example that there's somewhere online. I can go bump that out if you if you would like for all of us to see it. Uh, we're on chapter six, correct? Yeah. Computations, maybe? Uh, no, that's section six, chapter two. That is, is I think you'd want two dash. Uh, oh no, three dash something. Are those our figures, maybe? Sorry. 23 is probably the right one. Uh, um. Sorry, Russ, I'm wanting to go into the correct. Crosstalk, advanced, geo, it's got to be this one. Let's try this one. Yeah, I think I think it's just the chapter contents, to be honest, unless there's something I've missed. Um, maybe we'll try. So this is the first one that we dumped in that we were trying to incorporate. Ah, yes, no, it, um, if you look, hold on, um, yeah, so um, if you look at the, the there's a, an example of what your R script should look like when you put together the HTML widget thing to, to call Payety, and the, the function Payety underscore HTML is like, separate from the payety function so there must be some magic involved okay. that gets that called where and and it so when you call payety it creates some html content that is then wrapped by there that we go. html function so maybe you can just add it so that would be at the bottom of the r file then right Sorry. Yeah, yeah. This one over here. So, so is that just HTML widgets and magic? Because th that's the thing I was puzzled about is, you know, we're not actually passing anything, you know, we're to, to the dots in a sense, like we're, yeah. we're taking our, 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 our widget function and then like it's getting wrapped by this, this. You know, yeah, I think I, I, mean, I, was, HTML. I was looking at the, um, the, the parameters for create widget. And there are, I think that there is something called a, a pre-render hook, which may be, may be the thing that pay HTML is responsible for. Uh, sorry, one of the one of the function parameters, the pre-render hook, modifies the. Um, um the 
widgets. Oh, yeah. I've got a quite disgusting dog sat <laughs> stuff next to me. Um, um, uh, yeah, I think what you'd have to do, oh, yeah, you'd have to na name it so that it's my pathy example underscore HTML. Um, then, oh, even here we would as well? I think so, yeah, yeah. Well, that... Does that make sense or is that... That's that's fine, but your um the the subsequent so calling it here yeah would it just be pay the HTML then? I I don't think so. I think it would be my pay as the example underscore HTML. But okay. when you're calling it in that browsable thing, it would just be my pay as the example. I'm not. I, I, <laughs> I guess I didn't. I'm not. That one didn't. I didn't follow that one. Okay. So the, the relationship that we're calling in this browsable function is passing a tag list. That tag yeah. list is all of these sub functional calls. Yeah. Yeah. And so the, um, the, the function we're wanting to pass these to is yeah, is that this one, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um I'm almost done, sorry. So full T. I'm quite excited to see whether this will work. Right. Because it yeah, seems I, quite I am as well. But <laughs> for the for the purposes of our recording and and watching everything, uh, just notice I did reload all. The uh -huh. the comment from the author says that you need to to rename or sorry, reload the namespace. So um, by calling on DevTools load all, that's an important component. Okay. Uh, donut could not find function. Typo on the bottom. That's me not typing well. Where's the donut at? I don't think that's the code. No. That you... This one, right? Yeah. So that final line of that needs. Put it in the right space. Okay, so that hmm. is fine, but we didn't. I think we didn't run the. I think on line thirty-three of your script, your your thing should be called your function there should be called my pity example. Yeah. All right. Because yeah. it seems like there's some. HTML widgets is looking within the namespace for your package to mm -hmm. find a function that matches the the. Now, if I if I if I copy and paste this in again, so that we have our inline text, mm. each one of these is still going to be my payday example. Yeah. But you you copied and modified that before, so you've probably got it in your history already. Okay, sir. Uh, All right. There is there. Yeah. My page is Okay. I worked. Yeah. I worked. <laughs> That's so as a as a as a final closing on on this, I guess point of this underscore HTML. It, it, I had the impression when the auth or when I'm reading the author's words that this is important. Because if you're passing anything of uh, change. It is in a dynamic form to manage that information. The function takes the three dot construct and uses them in HTML tools tag. The three dots are necessary because internally HTML widgets needs to be able to pass the ID class and style attributes to the tag. So the dot 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 is just taking in this ID class and style. But the, the, the form of HTML tools is looking for function name underscore HTML. Can I change it to something else and still get it to operate properly? I don't know. And the, I asked that question because in the second example here, we're, we're given this my widget underscore HTML. That does not follow the previous example where we were 
calling it on the package library uh, or the, 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 the package name itself. And with uh, the... thanks, thanks, Russ. Uh, I I think you just banned on the uh, yeah. There's a little solution, section yeah. in in oh, the code sorry, for HTML widgets where it for any given widget that you define in your package, and you know when you call the function for that widget, um, there's a little bit of code in HTML widgets that will look for the the name of your widgets you know your your function name for that widget with underscore HTMLs after it in the package where you defined that widget so like in your my example my pay example in the package where you defined that if there's a my pay as the example underscore HTML it will use that HTML widgets will identify that HTML modification function. Okay. And uh, use it, but I don't know quite how it, quite how it uh, returns it but, it, but yeah, it's quite cool. Um, so look up. I can read, we can read this at a later point. Uh, now that it's yeah. part of our anyway, history, our thread. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, thanks for taking us through it, Ryan. It's quite an interesting chapter, to be honest. And the, the, there's a few things in there that, um, it, it was an interesting example because the, the way that the, the, the data's connected to the chart is slightly different from the mm -hmm. examples that we had in chapter two or three or whenever it was when we, we, we looked at the, the initial um, thing. um right and uh yeah uh that's so cool i'm gonna stop sharing and i'll let us make the closing remarks because we're way over on time sorry about that um uh for chapter seven do we have any uh no uh, as yet no i i'll probably okay. end up presenting it um i i okay. spoke to lucio through the slack you know the direct messages but I, he's not going back to me um there are three more chapters after that in section um two which get gradually more you know which are pretty much at the, the most advanced end of what you could do with html widgets the chapter eight is 20 pages of pretty advanced stuff and then there's something on the um what was the tool we used uh, crosstalk for linking widgets there's a, a chapter on that as well and then there's a, a kind of summary chapter at the end um all of which are up for grabs i i'll probably do chapter seven myself next week because you you two have just done the past couple of weeks so uh if, if that's okay but yeah the, the advanced one and the, the crosstalk chapter are certainly available if, if anyone wants it um uh yeah no that's brilliant so uh, to be honest i mean the the past couple of chapters have given us a good view into how to do this kind of stuff for a kind of you know on a, a, a relatively straightforward example of, of, of how to do it it's, it's cool Thanks, Ryan. Um, and thanks, Arthur, for coming along as well. Um, yeah, no, it's a good discussion. Um, cool. Right, anyway, I uh, will head off and I will see you next week. Uh, sorry if we've kept you <laughs> an extra quarter of an hour than you expected. Um, right, thanks for, thanks for the slides and everything. Thanks, everyone. See ya. All the best. Okay.